in the deadlock business, uh, basically the idea is the following. So there are processes and there are limited number of uh, resources around. Uh, and uh, so in this very basic configuration that we will discuss now, P1, process one, wants resource one, and it already has resource two. Okay, so process one has two, resource two, and it wants R1. But R1 is currently in use by P2. So if P2 finishes at some point, then R1 will be released, obviously. Then P1 can use that R1 and P1 can also finish. But in this deadlock configuration, P2 cannot finish because P2 also requires a different resource to finish, which is R2, but R2 is not available to it. It's R2 is currently held by P1. So it must wait for P1 to finish, uh, but P1 will not be able to finish because it is waiting for P2 to finish. So there is this kind of weird conflicting uh, scenario. Then you have a deadlock. Okay, so this is the simplest uh, case of a deadlock. And we can also visualize it through another scenario. So here the car is a process and it already has this resource called uh, horizontal road. Okay. But it also wants the vertical road, a second resource, but it can't get it because it is currently held by another uh, process. Uh, so this process, however, will not be able to finish because it wants the bottom horizontal road as another resource, but it can't get it because uh, it is also occupied by another process. So there is this cycling issue. And actually, this can even happen in real life. Maybe these cars are still in this configuration. We can't know, but there are obviously recovery mechanisms. The most simplest one is uh, to kill a process. So in this scenario, it will be like bomb a car or fire it, but it won't be a very realistic scenario. Another recovery can be preemption. So the process here, the car here, voluntarily gives up the resource, the road. So these cars voluntarily or non-voluntarily, it doesn't matter, but it, they leave this resource. So they leave this road operating system tells it to go. So we have seen this in CPU, right? Some processes are preempted from the CPU, same idea. Uh, so when these cars leave, these ones, the bus and stuff, they go, then they go. So everything can be handled. Um, so now let's go a little bit to the coding. Uh, and I, I want to talk about this uh, dining philosopher problems problem uh, again. So I have mentioned it in our previous meeting when we were talking about synchronization. But now I want you to uh, consider the uh, dead lag aspect uh, in the background of your brains uh, because we will see the dead lag and we will also see the dead lag free solution to this problem. So the problem is about philosophers sitting around a table, they all need, each one needs two forks to eat. Uh, so they are eating some kind of a noodle thing, uh, dinner. And also there are other hygiene issues, like they are sh uh, big philosophers, but they are still sharing a fork. So I think they overlooked that issue, but okay, still we can admit that we have this problem at our hands. Uh, so, and we need concurrency here because since they need only left and right forks, this guy and this guy, they can eat simultaneously, concurrently. And we want to enable that. Uh, okay. Similarly, this process or this philosopher and this, they can eat simultaneously. They can also eat simultaneously, but while this guy is eating, this guy cannot eat, etc. And there was this instant. So I basically copy pasted this uh, screenshots from a YouTube video where these guys are uh, simulating the problem. And this is a funny time in my opinion. So it is talking about the sharing event here. Uh, anyway, so the solution here, uh, let's first understand the solution. Uh, so a philosopher uh, 
or a pr process. So I will use these terms interchangeably. Uh, so processor, uh, process zero, for instance, he wants to eat. So uh, he wants to, uh, let's name these forks as zero, one, two, three, and four. Okay, so this philosopher wants the left fork, which is zero, fork zero. It is available currently. Uh, uh, and then it also wants the next zero plus one is one. There is this mod five to wrap around number five. After four, you go to zero. Uh, so he can get both forks and he's starting to eat, he's eating. During his eating activity, maybe process one wants to eat as well. So he attempts to his fork, which is fork one because philosopher one has the idea of one. So fork one, he wants this fork, but it is, it blocks here. Okay, natural, it can happen because they shouldn't eat simultaneously. But while this guy is still eating, I don't know, maybe processor three comes with three here. So it wants fork three, which is zero, one, two, three, this fork. It first gets the left hand, okay? And then it wants the right hand fork. They are both available. so. It is also eating. Now zero and three are eating. Uh, and one is waiting, unfortunately. The two and four, they are still thinking. They don't, they are not involved at all. And when zero finishes eating, uh, it signals, so it is the opposite of wait. So it, it signals to the semaphores, to the forks that it currently has. So that if there are someone waiting on these semaphores, they should be awakened. So this guy uh, forks, uh, sorry, signals to fork zero. Remember, this was fork zero. Uh, and also signals to fork one, which is this fork. Uh, and since there was a pr process, namely one, waiting on this fork, it gets notified. So when it's time comes to execute in the CPU, it now escapes from this weight because uh, the signal is received for the corresponding uh, weight call. Then this guy looks at the right hand, which is this fork, fork number two. It is okay, so he can also eat. So now let's talk about deadlock here. There is a deadlock situation uh, because we don't take both forks at once. So this guy, First left hand, it takes fork zero, okay? Then assume that a context switch occurred, which can occur arbitrarily. So this process or this philosopher, it uses his left hand to take this fork, okay, no problem. Then another context switch, and this guy takes the left hand fork two. And then another context switch, this philosopher takes the left hand, this and which is fork three. And finally, this guy takes the left hand, which is fork four. And now, uh, scheduler comes to this process, uh, this philosopher. It wants to get the right hand because it has already get, got the left hand. But the right hand here is occupied by P1, okay? Because fork one is in the left hand of this guy. So it, it can't, basically it blocks in this right hand call, okay? It has handled the left hand call, but it blocks in the right hand call. Similarly, when the time comes here, this one wants to use the right hand, but the right is occupied by the left hand of this. So still waiting. Then this wants to use right hand, but it is occupied by the left of three. So waiting, blue is waiting. Then this uh, wants to, eat with his right hand now, but this right is occupied by the left of philosopher four. And finally, philosopher four wants to eat, but the right hand of it is occupied by the left of this thing, this philosopher zero. So they can't start and I roll back to zero and I will do the same circle. So there is this circle that will uh, continue forever, okay? So this is a deadlock problem. And it is mainly, so I can solve this problem uh, by attempting to grab, get two forks at once, okay? So let's now talk about that solution, which we uh, discussed here, but let's, uh, previous week, let's now talk about it 
again uh, and also in your second assignment that i have announced written and announced yesterday it involves modifying this code so that's why you should understand here okay so uh, let's think about it together so i have philosophers uh, so here is the main idea uh, there will be again five philosophers i i don't care any amount of philosophers so each philosopher will eat uh, infinitely many times so you can also run this while loop from one to ten then each philosopher will try to eat ten times so it is a minor issue but what you do is uh, the philosopher i okay so this i comes from somewhere uh, randomly so that philosopher wants to eat so he wants to pick up two forks two forks at once okay if he can then he eats and then he releases those two forks uh, because some other philosophers might be waiting on those two forks or one of those two forks then it comes back to the thinking phase and maybe comes eat again okay so now let's handle this pickup and put down calls okay they are very important uh, pick up and put down and first of all i am writing this code within a monitor which we discussed last week uh, we, it is not the topic of this deadlock issue but basically monitor guarantees that there is only one uh, process within the monitor at any given time okay so what does it mean practically it means the following i have some global variables here called state for instance uh, normally if this was a regular class i should mutex lock mutex here and unlock mutex here before updating this uh, global value to uh, provide mutual exclusion but uh, writing a code within a monitor is simpler in that sense you don't worry about it uh, programming language already handles it for you okay so this is just a minor monitor issue now let's solve the problem uh, uh, processor uh, philosopher two uh, or zero okay let's start with zero zero wants to eat okay so state of zero is hungry obviously then it looks at it goes to test in the test it will look at the left element and the right element or i mean right um, philosopher and the left philosopher so zero plus one is one which is right and uh, for the left, I can't just do i minus one, by the way, because then it will be minus one. So I will still use this modular action. So zero plus four is four, four mod five is four. So left of zero is four, right? So um, I look at the left philosopher, which is not eating, okay. And right is not eating, okay. Then it means that I can grab both uh, forks at once. So, and am I hungry? Yes, I just set it to hungry so i am now eating i declare that i will eat and then i do some signal so this will be clear later so this is basically if someone has if i am this is to wake me up okay if i am already waiting to eat then i will wake myself up but currently it is not the case so don't worry about this so i say that zero is eating now so when i come back to my pickup I am eating, so I don't wait. I just start eating. That is the beauty of it. Um, so when I am eating, now let's assume one comes, but maybe I should get some visual uh, support here from our uh, picture. Uh, so can I get this here? Uh, where am I? Uh, let's put this here, otherwise I will also get confused. Uh, okay so we have this config so zero is eating now okay we have established that now for instance i1 comes okay i uh, so zero is here eating now philosopher one wants to eat so philosopher one uh, comes here it declares that i am hungry okay it looks at the uh, left of it which is zero and right of it but be careful the left of it 
is already eating. So this statement, if false, then I don't start eating. I am not eating. So I come back here. Since I am not eating, I wait on this condition variable. So condition variable is just a synchronization primitive uh, and it uh, helps you to wait on a particular condition. Here, the condition is uh, left and right of this guy. This guy must be uh, available. So this condition is currently not satisfied. So I am waiting on that condition as process one, philosopher one. Okay, so I am waiting. Now let's assume two comes and be careful. In this deadlock free implementation, this guy doesn't grab the this fork, okay, the second fork, because since it can't grab the left fork, it doesn't even hold this fork. And this is the smart idea. This helps me prevent the deadlock. So when the processor two comes, okay, so again, zero is still eating. He is extremely hungry, apparently. Now two comes. Uh, and two declares that I am hungry and it goes to the test function with I equal to two. So I look at my left, which is six mod five is one. Okay, it is not eating. It is waiting, but it's not eating. So state is not eating. And right of two is three, two plus one is three, not eating. So now I am eating and I am hungry. So I am eating. And since I am eating, I don't wait. So at this time, two and zero are eating and one is waiting. Let's assume that zero is now full. So it puts down his uh, forks down. Okay. Now let's see how it will signal process one. So I put down zero is my index. So I am not eating anymore. I, my state is thinking. And now I will use this same function but for, for a different kind of different uh, task. So I will talk with the left and right neighbors. Okay, so although I am zero, I will first talk with four, which is this, and I will also then talk with one, which is this. So let's talk with one. When one comes here, uh, Actually, one still can't eat, so right, because the right hand of one is still occupied by two. Okay, yeah, so it was my bet in this real time example, so it is not a bad thing. So, we will just uh, it will increase our discussion on this topic. So, two is still eating, so one wants to eat, but right neighbor of one is what this state two, it is eating. That's why this is false. So one cannot signal itself. One cannot wake himself up, okay, unfortunately. So one is still not eating then. Okay, now let's, uh, what can we do? We can uh, get rid of two also. So assume that two is full now. So two has eaten. Two wants to put his fork down, okay? Now, eventually, one will be able to eat. So what two does is, two is thinking now, state two is thinking, and it talks with state one, okay, which is six mod five is one, this guy, uh, and also notifies state two. So when I talk with one, so then I is one here, uh, and I look at the left, fork and right fork so left philosopher and right philosopher of one so left is what index zero because five mod five is zero this is not eating remember this was full right is not eating okay this was full just full and i was hungry if you recall uh, i was already hungry so i am now eating and i signal myself so remember at the very old uh, at the very beginning of my discussion, I have used pick up one. So, and one was not eating, so cond one was waiting. And now cond one is signaled. So, that thing is now waking up. Okay, so this is the uh, full solution. Again, as far as the deadlock stuff is concerned, 
we attempt to take two forks at once. So there is an end here. If not, we will not go to the eating mode. We will just wait without allocating any uh, any uh, resource, which is the idea of preventing the deadlock here. So this is a deadlock free code. And so what does it have to do with your assignment? I don't know if you read it, but uh, I can also talk about it uh, here quickly. Uh, so that's part. So how should we go there? I can start sharing my uh, Chrome browser here. Yeah, so here in my website where I have this uh, assignments here. So the first part is irrelevant, but second part uh, is like this. So we have already discussed this monitor-based solution of dining philosopher problem. Now uh, uh, you will implement this basically, but there is no monitor in C and we will use pthread library. That's why you will use this mutex variable to handle your uh, global variable uh, handling, like the state stuff. You should put them between mutexes, as you know. And also you will use condition variables, just I have used in that example. Uh, but there is one little uh, novelty. Uh, I want you to, I, I require you, not you, the philosophers, to use three forks. So they are eating something uh, very weird, I guess. Uh, and they will still do the left and right, but they, there will also be a set of, a box of other forks, like uh, put them here, uh, uh, number of threads over three forks, okay? So you will also try to grab it. If you can grab all three at once, then you will do your uh, dining, okay? So this is the idea. I hope that you will add this little modification to your code successfully. Other than that, the code is already on that slide of my lecture uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, so it is that actually. And each uh, philosopher eats 50 times at most. So use a random number up to 50. Uh, so do that pick up and put down 50 times, etc. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, and there is also another uh, synchronization problem, but let's focus on the P thread stuff today. Uh, but as far as this assignment goes, I recommend you to start uh, really early. Uh, I know there will be your midterm next week, but still, uh, after that, you should start immediately. It is not that difficult, but this is uh, very new to you, and uh, it is two different programming happening here. So yeah. Okay, so let's come back to the, uh, come back to the uh, deadlock stuff. Uh, yeah, so I will now open my uh, separate deadlocks PowerPoint, which is also in the website. So now let's share that. Uh, John, can I ask a question yes. about the dining philosopher question? Yes, okay. Uh, John, if I understand correctly, the state represents both people and forks, right? No, the, the state represents the people, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, but while uh, checking, they check the state I and state I plus four. Yeah. Okay. It is the state of so a, a fork cannot be hungry, right? A people can be hungry. A person can be hungry. So think of it like that. You you go through that code again. It is. Okay. Uh, yeah. So think of it like this. A fork cannot be hungry. So think of it that way. Uh, okay. So now let's. I started sharing, right? Okay. Deadlocks. So we have already introduced the problem. Um, and uh, we have discussed the problem with a classical problem, uh, synchronization problem called dining philosophers. Here, 
is a very extremely simple example, not the dining philosophers, but uh, for instance, I have only two sources, resources, like two disk drives, R1 and R2. Uh, uh, so I, so this A is for R1 and this B for R2. So I wait on A, okay, then a context switch occurs. So the second process waits on another resource. Okay, still okay. It waits on B and this continues, but it blocks here because it can't get passed through here because A was already weighted here. So now when the turn comes to P0, it's the next statement is very unlucky. It waits on B, but B will be stuck here forever. So this is a deadlock. Yeah, okay, actually we have talked about them. Uh, another, so this is the same representation here. Okay, so this is an important part. Uh, so these four conditions must be all true to have a deadlock, okay? So I repeat, uh, all these four different uh, conditions must uh, hold uh, and only in that scenario you may have a deadlock. So what are these conditions? So there is some mutual exclusion in your system. What is it? Uh, there are some resources, they're limited. So there is a resource and uh, only one process can use it at a time. So it means that when process one is using it, P2 comes and P2 cannot use it because P1 is using it mutually exclusively, okay? So this must hold, you must have a case like this in your system, otherwise you won't have a deadlock, okay? So in other words, if all your uh, resources are shareable, like P1 uses one resource, P2 uses another resource, not the same, then they can all live happily ever after. Hold and wait, what is this condition? A process uh, or a thread, uh, a process holding at least one resource is waiting to acquire additional resources held by other processes. So I already uh, have a resource in my uh, at my disposal, so I obtained it. And now I wait on other, uh, I ask for another resource. Now it is a, a dangerous situation because uh, I may not get what I want, so I may wait indefinitely for that thing, uh, and that's why the one I keep will be with me forever and without doing nothing. Okay, so all that wait is that no preemption. A resource cannot be preempted, cannot be given away uh, in the middle of nowhere. So a resource can be released only by the process holding it, and when does it release it? After that process is done with that resource. Okay, so for instance, a printer, I just, I am done with the printer, then I am done, then I release it. But I, I don't want to release it before uh, finishing my printing action. And final condition is that, uh, what is that? Uh, we have this circular weight. Actually, we have witnessed this in our dining philosopher example, if you recall. So uh, you have this uh, demands from P, P0 wants something held by P1, P1 wants something held by P2, and in the end, Pn minus one wants something held by P0. So this is exactly the dining philosopher configuration we have discussed 27 minutes ago. Uh, so this must happen in your system as well as the other three. Then you may have a deadlock. Uh, so first of all, current operating systems, Unix, Linux, uh, Windows, uh, Solaris, they don't really deal with deadlocks because uh, it is an overhead. We will see some deadlock prevention al avoidance algorithms. Uh, they are costly to run in the background. Also, uh, the, these are these are not the responsibilities of the operating systems. 
but still we will show you some solutions maybe in the future they may be implanted in us in an os but still uh, there is no dealing with deadlock so the programmer the application must deal with deadlock and operating system doesn't uh, mess with that so and most likely process kills itself okay exit exit zero or exit minus one whatever um, it is the recovery uh, and also process itself may prevent from entering a deadlock so everything is on the process side uh, but deadlock is a general operating system issue okay so that's why we are talking about it uh so then what am i doing here we have some deadlock representations how to represent the deadlock uh, to deal with it we have resource types m resources uh they can be scanners whatever uh and each resource has wi instances okay maybe you have four uh, disk drives etc and each process utilizes a resource as follows it requests the resource, then it may wait. Uh, if it doesn't wait, or it is signaled or something, it uses the resource, and then it releases the resource. Okay. So now I can build a graph, data structure states, uh, a graph uh, using these uh, entities. How I will do it? the vertex set of my graph will consist of the processes p and the resources r and there will also be edges in my graph they will be the waiting for uh, edges or or, or uh, assignment edges so here for instance this is a process uh, a vertex this is another vertex uh, and within it i have number of instances here for uh, and here is a request edge right it is called request edge uh, so p1 requests one of rj and here is an assignment edge so this rj the first instance of rj belongs to pi so now let's look at the system from this graph's point of view to analyze it uh, clearly and easily so p1 here uh, uh, so this instance is assigned to p1 okay and the second instance of r2 is assigned to p2 and p1 requests r1 but r1 is also uh, assigned to p2 so p1 cannot get it now and p2 by the way p2 also wants r3 to complete because it wants it obviously it will use it uh, and R, but it can't get it because R3 is assigned to P3 currently. But P3 is very standalone. It's so there is no circular stuff here, right? For instance, so there can't be a deadlock, for instance. Uh, so what happens is after some time, uh, P3 will finish. So maybe this is merge sort. I don't know, but it doesn't require any resource. It's uh, very, Hojan? Yes. Uh, one small question the yes. dots in these resource uh rectangles represent like how many processes or threads can uh use that resource at the same time right uh not quite right so these dots mm -hmm. uh, are the number of instances okay mm -hmm. one two three so for, mm -hmm. for instance this will always be three mm -hmm. but no process is using it so don't mm -hmm. connect it with the processes okay no, no, I mean, like, uh, for example, for R2, it has two dots, it has two dots. so that yes. means the two processes at the same time can use it. Yes, uh -huh, yes. Yeah, okay, exactly. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, just to uh, clarify the notation, thank you. Yes, yes, and this is the notation. So R2, so currently P1 and P2, they are both using uh, two different instances of R2. And then P3 finishes. It will release R3, obviously, because it is dead now. Now P2 will use this R3 uh, because it was requesting it, and now it is assigned to it. So there will be an edge like this in your graph. 
it will be like this uh, and it will use it and then it will finish and then this will handle this cycle etc so why are we talking about this here let's also come back what is this slide doing the slide is doing something else okay let's see p3 for instance it requests uh, a source a resource re r2 but this is a deadlock okay why because i have a cycle here see the directions of the edges are important i have a cycle uh, and i can't give r2 to you because r2 there is no third r2 here all resources are held by waiting processes since the waiting processes will not run they will not release the resource yes as we know deadlock okay uh, so graph with a cycle has a deadlock here however here is a graph with a cycle but no deadlock uh, so here is a cycle see the directions are all pointing to a cycle but then uh, in this system there may not be a deadlock because what because of this reason the second uh, p2 and p4 they will finish eventually because they don't depend on any other thing so it means that this r1 the second r1 will be released and then this p1 who was expecting to use r1 can use this instance okay so i have this edge now not this instance unfortunately not unfortunately but anyway uh, but this instance so now there is no deadlock because after some time p1 can finish now uh, but even without that p4 will finish so then this resource will be given assigned to p3 so everything can finish so the result is uh, if a graph contains a cycle it may have a deadlock uh, it will have a deadlock if only one instance is available okay so you have only one dot and you have a deadlock you have a cycle then there will be a deadlock but if there are multiple several instances then there will still be a possibility of deadlock and if there is no circular thing then there won't be a deadlock at all because as we discussed in our rule set here circularity is something we need to have a deadlock so if there is no cycle then you don't have a deadlock at all okay so the, this is the representation stuff now i will talk about uh, the pre prevention for instance in the next class so we will take a break now but in the next class is a spoiler alert i can tell you that the preventing is about negating one of these four conditions okay one or some of these conditions because even without one of them there won't be a deadlock so i can prevent a deadlock so i will talk about it and then i will also avoid the deadlock using an algorithm called bunkers algorithm so uh, and this is likely to come in your exam so that's why you should really stick in for the next class uh, yeah okay so let's give a 10 minutes break then i will see you okay so deadlock handling uh, is about uh, preventing a deadlock from happening or avoiding a deadlock uh, so, uh, there will also be deadlock detection mechanisms so you allow to deadlock to happen but then detect it somehow without locking the system everything getting uh, old detection mechanism is also a part of handling uh, and ignore the problem and pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system so actually this is the uh, interesting this is the solution used by the operating systems uh, because <clears throat> detecting preventing avoiding is costly uh, so recovery is about so handling it is mostly uh, left to the application okay uh, but still operating system kernel code can also implement these ideas uh, yeah so keep that in mind so prevention is about making one of those from four conditions false these four conditions uh, mutual exclusion hold and wait no preemption and circular weight 
Okay, and avoidance is similar but not the same. It ensures that the system is never in the unsafe state where deadlock is possible. So I will never put the system into an unsafe state. So with that, I am avoiding the deadlocks. Okay, so you can still use prevent term here, I guess, as far as the English language is concerned. Uh, but we separate them. Okay, prevention is about negating these four conditions that we will discuss now, uh, and avoidance is about uh, keeping the system in the safe state at all times. Okay, so let's do prevention now. Basic principle uh, is the following in all these four cases. I will restrict the ways I make the requests, the processes make the requests. Uh, and if only one of these four conditions are false, then is false, then no deadlock. So let's try to negate one of them. You can also negate all of them, obviously, but uh, even one is enough. So mutual exclusion condition, what was it? Uh, there is a resource, process one is using it, but process two also wants to use it. Uh, that's why I need a mutual exclusive uh, access to that resource because they may interfere with each other. So once the process one is done with that resource, now P2 can use it. This is how we implement mutual exclusion idea using mutexes. So, but I can uh, get rid of mutual exclusion by the following trick. Obviously, I can buy a lot of resources and put it into a very big hardware case. Then every process can it's have its own shareable resource, but this is not what I meant. I have a better solution based on a software called spooling software for instance uh, you have this printer we have only one instance of it we bought only one printer but uh, now i will uh, enable this spooling software it basically it's a software when a process wants to print a document that software copies that document into this spooling folder and then that uh, process making the request it continues like it just used the resource and it just released okay so it doesn't wait the actual printer printing to happen okay uh, so it goes away uh, and now i virtually made my printer shareable okay because this is a software obviously there is a limit on the number of files you can put into the spooling directory but still it is a very uh, useful and practical solution okay so then again p1 when it uh, uses printer one p2 can also use the same printer because they basically put the content into the spooling folder then at some point they will be printed so we rely on the spooling software let's negate hold and wait what was it uh, so remember i am a process i am holding a resource r1 but i also want a resource r7 this is the hold and wait because i am waiting on r7 and i may wait on r7 forever due to the deadlock happening uh, and then what happens is r1 which is currently held by me is not available so I am holding it forever, basically. So how do I how do I negate this condition? Here is a solution. Uh, whenever a process requests a resource, uh, it doesn't hold any other resources. So you can do the following: in the beginning of the process, uh, in the main function, for instance, you try to allocate all the resources that this process will use at some point maybe it will use it in line 285 but you will allocate that resource in the first line so this is an underutilization obviously because during that time from line 0 to line 285 you don't use that uh, resource but you allocate it so it is underutilization you don't really utilize your 
system uh, good enough. Uh, but this is a solution, right? Because if you can allocate all of them, it means that you will not wait on any other of them during your execution. So you only have hold, which is not hold and wait. Uh, and if you can't allocate all of them in the beginning, you just wait. Uh, you don't start execution. Uh, and at some point, uh, since it is now not a deadlock, it's a deadlock free system now, at some point, those resources will be uh, available. And at that time, you start your journey. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, uh, you are making a re really low resource utilization with that. Uh, idea and starvation is possible. What is that starvation? So this process may wait forever because all of them may not be available at the same time. No preemption condition is the following. Once you have this resource, you will only release it when you are done with that resource. Okay, so you finish the business, you start like in an action movie. Uh, but uh, I can negate this condition easily. How can I do it? If a process that is holding some resource requests another process that cannot be immediately allocated to it, then all resources that you hold, you release them. So you are like a very emotional person. You can't get what you want, so you give up everything. Uh, so this is Without completing your task, you give up your resources. You can implement it like that. Uh, and by the way, okay, you are emotional, you gave up your resources, but you are still a process in the system. So what you do is uh, those resources are added to the list of the resources for which you are waiting and uh, you will resume your execution once those uh, when once you have access to old resources as well as the new ones but you may you may go back a little bit in time because you have you have now your old resources all over again so maybe you should start a lot of things again actually so do you see that the overheads here involved so far even with this overhead that's why operating system doesn't do it for you Okay, so assume that you have an operating system that implements this no preemption negation tactic. So that implements preemption. So you are a resource and out of nowhere, you lose your resources because the kernel wants that way. So, the, so do you see the point here? So that's why operating systems don't are not involved with these decisions. These are all about the processes decisions. Similarly, mutual exclusion so operating system uh, don't want to provide you this software or uh, what was the issue in the hold and wait uh, okay so assume that you are an operating system uh, and you don't start a program so you are double clicking a, a program but uh, your operating system doesn't let you run it uh, because there is a danger of deadlock okay so it is good that they don't do it actually. Uh, and circular weight can also be handled like this, can also be negated like this. Uh, remember again the dining philosopher example, zero ways for one, one ways for two. Uh, uh, and at some point, n minus one waits for zero. So if I always, if I never go back in time, so if I always make the, waiting for the next bigger uh, index, then there won't be a problem. Okay, so this is how you can handle that. Deadlock avoidance is the following. Uh, we have this, uh, we have, will use some a priori information. Okay, uh, and so this is the region that I can travel in, safe region, and deadlock, will only occur in this blue region, unsafe region. And my task is to keep my process in this gray area at all times. And to do that, I will use some initial information from the process. And what is that information? Each process must tell me the maximum number of resources 
of each type that it may, it may need. Okay. <clears throat> so again, this may be hard to measure, but uh, that, that's why operating system doesn't implement this mechanism again. Uh, but assume that uh, it does, or assume some other process is uh, implementing this mechanism. So then everyone should uh, provide this information to that uh, uh, algorithm. Again, what is the information? Maximum number of resources of each type that it may need. Uh, so, um, if I have only single instance of each type, then uh, I can avoid uh, deadlock using the allocation graph representation we have seen before. Uh, but if I have multiple instances, then it is more complicated. Then I need this algorithm, Bunker's algorithm. Uh, okay, so Bunker's algorithm actually it needs this information, a priori information. So for the single instance case, no such information is needed. So what is that doing? Single instance in that scenario. Uh, so uh, we have claim at pi rj indicated that process pi may request rj okay so p1 may request r2 p2 may request r2 so again these are a priori information i need this information not the maximum number stuff but i this is a prior information claim at converts to request at when a process requests a resource okay so P2 requests R2, then this is a request that should we allocate? Again, I am in the avoidance business, so I need to answer this question. Request that converted to an assignment that when the resource is allocated to the process. So yes, I allocate here, for instance. Uh, so, but what happens if allocation is done like this? Request that will be converted to this assignment at the solid at this new state has a cycle see uh, and so and it means that we have an unsafe state there is no deadlock currently because p1 is not as it is not uh, requesting this it is just there is only claim dashed here but there is a potential that's why i am in an unsafe region so because there is a cycle and i have single resources as we discussed in the resource allocation graph uh, discussion before, uh, it is it may imply a, a deadlock. Actually, if you have single resources, it will definitely cause a deadlock, which is my case here, right? I have a single instance scenario. That's why I will not grant this allocation request because in that case, I will have a, a potential deadlock Although not currently, it may happen in time. So it will bring me to the unsafe state. So to avoid that uh, so unsafe state, I declare that allocation. Although there is no deadlock currently, there may be a deadlock. So I am in the unsafe state. Okay, so that is with the single instance issue, but that is not so realistic, right? Because in general, we have multiple instances of each resource type. Uh, then I will need a different mechanism because with multiple instances, if you recall our resource allocation discussion, multiple instance case, a cycle may or may not imply a deadlock. That's why you may still be in the safe state with multiple instances. So it is very confusing in that case. So I don't handle the multiple case with, a, with this graph tactic. I need a different mechanism. Here is that mechanism called the bunkers algorithm. Uh, so here, each process declares the maximum usage. Uh, but again, the prior information is also used in this avoidance algorithm. The claim information is declared a priori. Here, the a priori information is the maximum usage. When a process requests a resource, it may have to wait. When a process gets all its resources, it must return them in a finite amount of time. Uh, yeah, so these are 
the conditions. So now let's implement this algorithm. I, I understand this algorithm. So I need some data structures. Uh, so let n be the number of processes and m be the number of resource types, like one uh, types, printer, scanner, disk drive, etc. Uh, then these are the data structures. This is an array, a vector or an array of elements of length m. Okay. Remember, m is the number of resource types. So understand it like this: if available j is equal to k, it means that there are k instances of R j available at that time. Okay. Available j equal to k means that. There are k instances of Rj available to you. Maximum is a matrix. It's an m by m matrix. And the ij entry means the following. Process i may request at most k instances of Rj. Okay, so i, k, j. So this is your prior information. Uh, and allocation is the following. Again, process i is currently allocated k instances of RJ. So PI is currently using k instances of RJ in your allocation graph. Then what is the need? I have the maximum necessary and I have the current allocation. So the difference is max minus alloc. It is your need. In other words, need RJ means PI may need k more rj to complete okay yeah so available is your hardware configuration right how many scanners do you have how many disk drives do you have max is initially declared by process again it needs to find it so this is again a complicated thing to declare because uh, the number of resources you use may depend on your runtime, maybe during your for loop, uh, depending on the uh, execution range of that for of that for loop, the number of uh, declarations will be different. So but you can somehow give this uh, max value, okay? Uh, you will at most request this many amount of resource. Allocation initially is zero because nothing is allocated to no one. And so since this is zero, max minus zero is max. So need is initially max. Here is an example. Let's make things clearer and clearer. Uh, I have five processes, okay? P0, P1, P2, P3, P4. And I have three resource types, A, B, C. And A has 10 instances. So the existing vector is 10 for A, 5 for B, and 7 for C. So what is the available vector at this current time? Okay, so I am in the middle of my system. Let's take a snapshot. So the available vector, you will compute it, okay? Using the hardware configuration minus the current allocation. So for instance, what is the resource A? It is currently allocated by P1, P2, P3, and they allocate different amounts. So in total, I have four, seven allocated. I already have 10, so available is three. In other words, 10 minus sum of the current column. Okay, see row index is changing, column is fixed. Similarly, what is the availability of B at this time T? It is three, right? Because B has two in use, five, in total, three. C has seven in total and five in use, so I have two C available. So you will compute your own available. Uh, now let's uh, continue uh, with some notation issues. So these are not. Uh, uh, so this is for comparing components, okay? So it will be clear later. We may not even need to understand here. So here is the avoidance algorithm. What is this doing? Uh, check whether a given state is safe or not, okay? This is what I want to do. 
And to do that, uh, I have this uh, mechanism. Uh, basically, I allocate the resources to a particular process, let it run, and when it is finished, it releases the, those resources. And with those releases, uh, I have now a better working set. I will finish another process. And with that manner, if I can finish all the processes, then I am in a safe state. So let's understand this uh, with an example. Uh, no, yeah, okay. We have an example here, hopefully. Uh, so assume that processes declared their max demands as following. Okay, so for P0 will use at most seven, this at most five, this at most three, at, et cetera. Um, so later on, we have the following system. Okay, I have this condition. So I want to execute this algorithm. Okay, this one, two, three steps. Again, this will decide whether I am in a safe state or not. So let's answer that. First, you need to create your own need matrix. Okay, uh, which is basically max minus uh, allocation. Uh, so I need this many amounts. So what is it? P0 currently has only one B in it. That's why it needs four more B. And it also needs all the seven A's and all the three C's because it doesn't have any of them. So seven for three is for P0. Similarly for P3, for instance, it will ask for two maximum and it already has two. So it doesn't need NA. Okay but it requires two at most, at most, it has one, so it still needs one and one. So with that, you will drive your own need matrix in your algorithm. Then, uh, what is my availability? Remember, I am able to understand derived available matrix or vector. How does it work? Uh, I look at my hardware configuration, I have 10 A's, and I look at my current snapshot in my allocation, look at the column, I use five of it, I have 10, not five of it, sorry, I use seven of it, I have 10, so I have three available. Similarly with B, I have five available to the system, I bought it with money, uh, but now I have used two of them, look at this column only, so I have three available. And for uh, C, I have seven of them, and I have used five of it. I have two available. Now I am ready to execute this complicated looking algorithm. Okay, so it's not that complicated as you will see. I set up my need, my allocation, my available, blah, blah. So now my task is the following Is this a safe state? This is my question, right? In the beginning, is uh, this. Hocam? Can I ask a question like before we move on to more like detailed explanation? So the max matrix uh, shows how much of a particular resource a process might need at most, right? Yes. Okay. And we're trying to basically like minimize the sum of that available vector to ensure like maybe highest performance in a way. No, no, there is no minimization. Ah, there's there's no. Minimization. Oh, okay, okay. No, there is no minimization. It is an obvious uh, arithmetic operation. So available is uh, your, uh, it doesn't have to do anything with max actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just uh, use the hardware configuration value and we subtract the currently in use guys. So these are not in use. So three is still available. Mm -hmm. Seven is not available because it is allocated to somewhere else. I don't care. Uh, but three is available, so there is no minimization. Now let's continue. Uh, so is this a safe state? Remember my question. This was your configuration. You have this allocation situation. You already know your max in the beginning. Is this a safe state? So answer that. I have computed need matrix and I have computed available matrix. Now let's answer the question. So to answer that, I will pick a process with this availability and try to finish it. So can you uh, 
and you find the process here that can finish with this 3, 3, 2. So this can't finish, right? P0 can't finish because it needs seven, but the available is three, so it can't finish. But P1 can finish because it is one, it needs one, I already have three. It needs two, I already have three. It needs two, I have two. So I can run P1. P3 can finish, but let's go in this order, okay? So I need to find the sequence. So P1, I will select it. I run it uh, with this availability. And so P1 will finish. Then what happens is the following. P1 was already using two of A. And now that P1 is out of my life now, it is finished. I give this two back to the availability. So this becomes five, three, two at some point. Uh, where did I write it? Uh, okay, I am writing it in the below here. Okay, so P1, once it finishes, uh, available becomes 532. But before that, I also show you the intermediate steps. So, so let's also do it. So if you run P1 first, then what happens is, let's understand what I am writing here. Uh, Available becomes two, three, zero. Uh, okay, so because one, uh, one so uh, P one, uh, it needs one, two, two. So then, uh, why has this become two, three, zero? Let me remember. Uh, 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 because P, P1 needs one of A, two of B, and two of C, uh, and I give that uh, one here, so it becomes three, okay? One comes here, it becomes three, and similarly, I give this two it requires, so P1 can finish. Uh, and then, so this is the important part, actually, the first thing I said. So with P1 finishing, uh, what happens is this two is released back. So I have now five, three, two. So let me write it. Apparently the slides aren't writing it clearly. So I have now five, three, two, and I have P1 over. So with five, three, two, which process can you run? Can you finish any process? I can't finish P0 because it needs seven. I have only five. I can't finish this. And I can uh, finish this, but I want to finish P3 first. I go in chronological order. Uh, so, okay, with 0, 1, 1, I can handle it with this availability. And when it is finished, all these allocations are released. So this becomes seven, this becomes four, and this becomes three. And this is over. So P3 is over. Now with seven, three, seven, four, three, can I finish? I can finish everything, right, actually. So let's finish, let's go in this order. Let's finish P4. Okay, P4 is... And once it is finished, it will release these two allocated resources. So it will become 745 and so on and so forth. I think you understand the rest, but let's finish it. With 745, can I finish? Yeah, I can finish both of them, but let's select this one. So I finish this and it will release 302. So I will have 10, 4, Seven and with ten four seven, can I finish the only remaining process? Yes, I can. And let me finish it. Once it is finished, this is also released. So now I have the availability is equal to ten five seven, which is not a surprise because now no process is in action and all the existing resources are available. Right. So this is the idea. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, so I, yeah, this is uh, making some blah blah here, but uh, that thing I described was the algorithm. Uh, okay, now let's go further uh, on this issue. Actually, not on this issue, this is the avoidance. So basically, this algorithm tells me whether it is safe or not. If it is not safe, then uh, I should uh, avoid it, okay? So I, I should never come into that state. So I, we will come into that a little bit later. Uh, so again, that lock detection, now we are talking about, allow the system to enter deadlock, so no avoidance. Do the detection algorithm and the recovery. Recovery can be killing in the simplest way. Finish that process. Uh, so again, I have two types of uh, configurations. Single instance for each resource. Uh, then I can use the allocation graph because then the cycle means a deadlock. Or the multiple instance for each resource. Then I will use something similar to the banker's algorithm. Okay, so I will extend that. Let's first talk about this uh, detection in this configuration where I have a single instance for each type. Uh, then basically, this is my resource allocation graph we have discussed before. So P1 has PR2 uh, and once R1, but R1 currently is allocated to P2. So in other words, P1 is waiting for P2. So here is this edge. So your task is to convert your resource allocation graph into a waiting for graph, wait for graph. Okay, so two uh, waits for five because two is actually waiting for three, but three to be released needs P5 because P5 is holding R3. So you have this wait for graph, then a cycle in this graph will tell you that there is a deadlock in your system. And then this is a directed graph, then comes your algorithms class. There are ways to detect uh, a cycle into, in a directed graph. Basically one algorithm is uh, you run a direct, uh, depth first search, search DFS, uh, so let me run it and you will also remember it. So start from here, go as deep as possible. So start time one, then here, start time two. From here, go to here on the way, start time three. From here, go here, start time four. Now, this is a back edge. And whenever you have it, you have a, a cycle. So there's a theorem on this. Uh, and I must use this edge the back edge because from four this is the only where i can only place i can go so you have a back edge meaning that you have a, a cycle we have some proofs on this theorem like if you have a back edge then you have a cycle but let's skip it for now uh, it is not immediately re relevant so this is uh, the handling of detection with a single instance let's now do the banker's algorithm to uh, detect that luck with multiple instance case. Uh, I have all these uh, structures and to, for the detection, I don't need the max matrix actually. Um, I will use something similar to the need matrix called request matrix. So let's see this in action, then you will understand it better. So detection, uh, again, I am at this time T and my system is like this. Uh, P0 is allocated 1B, P1 is allocated 2A, etc. Uh, and uh, so P1 is requesting uh, 2A and 2C, uh, blah blah, so stuff like this. And the current availability is 0, 0, 0. Okay, so this they all belong to the uh, uh, snapshot of this time. So now out of nowhere, like the operating system, it triggers this deadlock detection algorithm to understand whether there is a deadlock or not in the system. In other words, can I 
finish this system using this availability and using these requests and this allocation. So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, so, by the way, is there a deadlock here? Uh, no, I guess, right? Because with this availability, I can finish P0, okay? Because it doesn't require anything. It requests nothing. So I can finish uh, P0. Let's finish it. And then this allocation is released. Now the availability is 0, 1, 0. And with that, I can't finish this. I can't, I can finish this because this already needs nothing. So let's finish this. And 303 is released, so I have 313 in total. With that, I can finish P3, yeah, uh, because it asks for only one A, and I already have three A's, so let's finish P3. And this 211 is released, making this 524. Uh, and yeah, so. With that, I can finish this P1. Also, the other thing was also, let's finish this. And 200 is released, so this becomes 724. And with that, I can also finish this. And when I finish it, this 2 is released. I have 726, which is the existing configuration, initial configuration. Now, let's answer some queries, okay? So here is my request. I am at this time T2, uh, and here is the request graph, uh, request uh, matrix. Apparently, P2 wants one of C. So should I grant this request? Now, here is the banker algorithm. Uh, yes or no? Uh, so let's answer. So P0 runs with this availability. Uh, okay, and it finishes. So it gives one back. So I have zero, one, zero. Now with zero, one, zero, I cannot satisfy any other process, right? Because P1 wants two A, I only have zero. P2 wants one C, I only have, I just, I have nothing. I have zero. Uh, so P3 has wants one a i don't have a p4 wants two c i don't have a c so i shouldn't grant this request because it will it it will lead to a deadlock so deadlock is detected here uh, in the previous scenario so what is the difference between these two slides in the first example p2 didn't request anything because there was no such request all the requests are like this and this is okay uh, but when the process makes this request, banker algorithm disallows it because of this uh, deadlock situation. Uh, yeah, uh, then uh, we have this uh, detection. So how sh when should I trigger the detection algorithm? Uh, actually, uh, it depends on many aspects. So how often a deadlock is likely to occur? So how, uh, how frequently uh, you can make some benchmark tests and learn this. Uh, and also how many process will be affected by this uh, detection <laughs> recovery. Yeah. Uh, okay, actually this uh, finishes our deadlock business. So now I can take some questions, uh, and so I hope that the deadlock, the bankers algorithm uh, is clear, uh, which is a good way to avoid deadlocks and detect deadlocks with the multiple instance case. And single instance case is rather simple. A simple graph uh, processing is enough to handle your deadlock situation. Yeah, OK.